Thank you all for attending. Uh, this is uh, this is our last distinguished colloquium of the year, and um, I just want to remind you that as part of that, there's going to be a little extra social gathering up at uh, uh, just upstairs here after the talk. You can get a chance to meet, talk to the speaker if you like, enjoy a drink if you can, and uh, please partake. Um, I'm going to turn it over to our Vice President for Research, who's right here, Chris Keen, who's also uh, a member of the Department of Physics and Astronomy, in case you folks didn't know that, um, at, in order to introduce today's speaker. Chris, thank you. Okay, thank you, Brian. Okay, everyone, it's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Mike Campbell. Uh, Mike is the director of the lab Laboratory for Laser Energetics at the University of Rochester, which is Certainly, I think the largest laser lab associated with the university in the U.S. and probably the world. In the world, it's yes. Really one of the premier. Let me just give a very brief sketch of Mike. So, uh, Mike did his graduate work at Princeton. Uh, he then went to Laura Thurmore National Laboratory, uh, which, as many of you know, is the home of now home of the National Ignition Facility, laser, um, but uh, has been a major laboratory for laser fusion and indeed laser science for a long time. Mike was there for about 20 years, right. uh, and he rose up. <laughs> So after being at Livermore for about 20 years, Mike then went off to do a couple other things. He worked at a small company called Logos on biofuels. And he actually stayed in the energy sector. He actually wouldn't work as well for on some nuclear power issues at some other places. And then he returned several years ago to the University of Rochester, where he now directs the Laboratory for Laser Energetics. And he's going to tell us today about the very exciting activities in fusion there, as well as, well as their roles in education and training. It's really impressive. Well, thank you for inviting me, Chris. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to, it's a pleasure to be here. I've never, I've been to Washington State a lot, but not this part of Washington State. So it's a pleasure to always see something new. And uh, I've known about WSU for a long time because I'm actually working with Yogi and such or being involved in uh, some of the great work that's done here. So I'm finally glad to see where you work. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to talk about uh, laser fusion, uh, status and future plans, but also a lot about the University of Rochester, LLE, uh, some of the reasons why we're funded, and then some of the other activities particularly involved in laser plasma interaction physics. So here's, I'll give you a little overview. Uh, talk about stockpile stewardship. Uh, that's some, that's the, our principal funding mechanism. I'll explain why we do it and what it is. Then talk about the laser fusion program. We, we do what's called direct drive. I'll explain what that is. And then... Laser plasma research is a very active topic here. You know, how intense lasers interact with me media is something which is uh, you know, essential for laser fusion, but also a, an interesting subject in itself. So when you work for DOE, uh, and as Chris says, so LLE is the largest funded DOE activity outside its national laboratories. So all of you are invited to come. Uh, you know, the weather is sort of like here, but a little bit more snow because of the lake. Uh, but you know, we, we're the largest uh, laser-based research center in the world associated with the university. So, the, you know, so when you work for DOE, you always have to say, what's your mission? Why, why should they fund you? So there's, sort of, there's six reasons to do it. Uh, one is that we do fusion research. You know, we use lasers to create matter at extreme conditions you know, with pressures and temperatures and densities, which are hard to make, but lasers can do that. So we do that. Now, we want to do it with isotopes of hydrogen. They undergo fusion. You know, there's two principal ways of doing controlled thermonuclear fusion. One is called uh, magnetic fusion, to use large magnetic fields to control low-density plasmas. The other is to use intense lasers or pulse power machines to make matter at very high densities and to confine them only because of their inertia. So there's no, ex no external fields holding them together. So we do that. But of course, you don't have to compress hydrogen. You can compress iron, you can compress silicon, you can compress anything you want. You know, and of course, I think one of the most interesting things that's happened in science in the past you know, decades is that the universe is filled with planets. We knew that it, you know, uh, Coperni Coper Coper Copernicus told us that we went around the sun. You know, well, that was one, we didn't know what those other lights were. Well, they turned out they're stars. Well, then we thought we were in one galaxy. Well, the universe is filled with a trillion galaxies, and each one of them have hundreds of billions of stars. And now we find that most stars, or at least a good fraction of the stars, have planetary systems around it. So it's the last step in the Copernican revolution. One more 
And that's when we find the life outside, our, outside the Earth. That'll be the next step in intelligent life, and maybe a visit will be the further one, but who knows when that will happen. But we do a lot of work on this. We have uh, people who have uh, worked with uh, people here uh, leading that research. And that's, again, be a nice talk for some time to have in the future about all the work we do on looking at materials extreme conditions. It complements a lot of the work that's done on the Shock Physics Institute and the like. We make lasers. Uh, it is a laser laboratory, and it is one of the most uh, uh, capable and innovative laser laboratories in the entire world. And I'll show about that in a little bit. And this is a laser that we built, not for the University of Rochester, but we built uh, for the dynamic compressor sector at Argonne National Laboratory. And, it's, and, you know, and we make not only very good lasers, but because of uh, experience, we know how to operate them. So Rochester, we do uh, thousands of experiments a year. If you add up all our lasers, we do about 3,000 experiments a year. To give you a sense, the big laser at Livermore does 400 a year. A pulse power machine will do 150. So we do thousands of shots. And we do a lot of them for others researchers than those at the University of Rochester. So we operate a, 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 this as a user facility. And one of the things when we talked with Yogi about putting the laser at the Argonne, you want to have a laser that doesn't require five PhD student, five PhDs to run. You want something that knows how to operate, it's flexible, responsible to experimental needs, and that's this, by running our facilities as, a, as user facilities, we've learned to do that. So that was part of our philosophy, going the laser for there. It's an education institute. You know, we are, a, scale and a university. So over the history of LLE, and it'll be 50 years in 2020, uh, we've graduated around 500 PhDs, uh, about 350 or so from the University of Rochester, and 150 from other institutions. They come and use our, our lasers because there's no other place to do their thesis research, uh, and uh, I count them as part of our alumni. Also what we do, because this is a research uh, center of scale, it's not a PI with a postdoc and students. We have all that, but we also have to have groups and organizations to run such large uh, facilities and large programs. So we teach people how to be leaders, how to deal with the government, how to organize programs, how to deal with the public, how to manage and mentor people. And I use, there's two examples here. This smiling face here is a guy named Charlie Verdon. So Charlie Verdon ran the theory group at the University of Rochester for 20 years. Chris knows I was at Livermore. I hired him at Livermore to run the theory group for the laser fusion program at Livermore. Over time, he became head of the entire weapons program at Livermore. And last November, President Trump nominated him to be the chief scientist for nuclear weapons for the entire country. He has never done a nuclear test. He's never designed a nuclear weapon. But because of his expertise in the science and his leadership, he has now that role. This is uh, David Meyerhofer, who was also at uh, LLE for 25 years. He now runs the physics division at Los Alamos. So we train people not, you know, in many, many ways. Students are critical, and of course, training leaders are that way too. So here's LLE. What we do is uh, we have two major lasers. Uh, one is called the Omega laser, the other one is called the Omega EP. Not very, uh, let's say, inspired names. Uh, this has been operating since 95. We do about 1,500 experiments a year. It's constantly being upgraded and, and uh, improved. And I'll show you a little bit of that in the, in the next view graph. Uh, we have another laser here, which is actually four beams of the sniff laser that Chris referred to. Uh, and, and, you know, this produces, you know, a kilo, well, both these are multi-kilojoule, multi-terawatt facilities. Uh, this does up to 800 shots a year. And actually what we can do is we can do experiments here by itself, or else I'll show you later on, we can actually take some of the light and shoot it into the other laser. So we can combine the lasers to do different things. One of the nice things about multi-beam lasers is you can do experiments and then use the other laser beams to make extra sources for probing like x-rays or particles and things like that. So we do that a lot here. We have over 200 diagnostics. Uh, we can do from uh, less than a picosecond to tens of nanosecond pulses. Uh, very experimental, uh, very capable facilities. The other thing that we've done is actually add a lot of additional things like magnetic fields. We, have, we do plasmas. Inertial fusion likes to ignore magnetic fields. Well, we love magnetic fields. So we have built a magnetic field system that's up to 50 Tesla over uh, essentially a cubic, several cubic millimeter size. And then when we put this in systems, I'm going to show you a little bit of data from that, we can get magnetic fields up to 100 megagauss uh, in a plasma. Uh, we also, so we're funded by DOE and NSA. That's the Nuclear National Security Administration uh, through a cooperative agreement. We're not a national lab. We are, again, a university laboratory. We have around 300, there's awful, we have about 350 people. Uh, 
we have about, uh, right now, uh, 145 students, 100 graduate students and 45 undergraduates. Who, uh, and the undergraduate students include uh, students from institutions like MIT and Princeton, hopefully one of these WSU, uh, and they come do the research here. So we graduate about, five, about between five and 10 PhDs per year, and they go to industry, they go to the national laboratories, they go to academia. Uh, and we have uh, about 45 undergraduates, and the undergraduates come in, uh, they, at their junior and senior year, they'll spend uh, their off time here doing research with us. And we have about, uh, we have a high school program that every year takes 20 high school students uh, and teaches them, and each, they're given a faculty a scientist to mentor and to do a research project. And they go on to win uh, many of the science fair things and they go on, most over 90% of them go on to get advanced degrees. So it's a, education is a major focus. So this, uh, without going to a whole lot of detail, this is a laser. What we do, when you, when you shine lasers, you want to be able to place targets accurately because the, where the targets are placed is important for diagnostics and actually uh, how the laser hits it. So we put our targets are typically a millimeter in size and we get them within about five to 10 microns of target chamber center. We point the laser to about the same accuracy. Uh, the laser beams are they're not as good as LIGO, but they're all timed. There's 60 of them here to a few picoseconds. And this is a laser pulse that we actually do a lot of times with experiments. Our typical experiment will have a laser pulse of a few nanoseconds. Uh, and you'll see it's got a complicated shape to it, and I'll explain that a little bit later on why we do that. Uh, and there's, this is 60 beams overlap, so we measure the power of every beam, uh, absolutely, and then we overlap, and you see we get to a few percent RMS. So it's, a very, it's the most precise HEDP facility in the entire world, uh, is at uh, Rochester. So it's not the biggest, but it's the best. All right, let me talk about stockpile stewardship. So, uh, I grew up uh, during the Cold War. I was much younger then. I remember the Cuban Missile Crisis and crazy things. Hopefully many of you don't remember that or were not born when it happened. So the United States, you know, nuclear deterrence was a major thing after the war. And we have done 1,054 nuclear tests in the history of the United States, starting with uh, the Trinity device in 1945 all the way to 1992. These, all these nuclear weapons were designed on computers less powerful than my cell phone. Uh, and so you, do, you figured out how these things worked because you did experiments. What is stockpile stewardship? Nuclear weapons haven't gone away, right? I wish they did. I think we all wish the world did not have them, but they do. Uh, and you need expertise to make sure the ones you have are a deterrent. And also, you'll see they're also to make sure that you know what the other bad guys are doing. So, so stockpile stewardship is basically we don't test. And test, that's a good thing because it stopped the development of nuclear weapons. Uh, but also what we've now replaced it with uh, much more sophisticated computer modeling and most of the state-of-the-art experimental facilities, including DCS, we'll show that in a second. Uh, and so that's what stockpile stewardship is. Here's a little simple view graph of what it is. This is a nuclear test. Hope we never see that again. This, these weapons were designed on the Cray MXP in 1985, which processing speed is a couple hundred megahertz. My Apple phone is two, two gigahertz. And you imagine how this cost back in 1985 and what this cost today. So much, much more sophisticated capabilities of understanding these complicated events. And we have facilities like the Z facility in, at Sandia, uh, Omega at, at uh, Rochester, and the NIF at Livermore to create matter and conditions which are relevant for this. Uh, and why do you need it? I mean, uh, I, will, I will tell you, I, am, I regard myself as sort of left of center in how I view the world. Uh, I don't like a lot of stuff that's going on in the world, and I don't like nuclear weapons, none of us do. But you need it for deterrence. We haven't had a war after the Second World War because I think nuclear weapons prevented global catastrophe. But it's a, you know, it's, it's a sort of Damocles above us, which is always the issue. So you need to have experts so you're never forced to test. Right? You don't want to say, I want to start testing again. So this is actually the first test that Lawrence Livermore did in the early 1950s. And you can see this was a nuclear explosive that wasn't very powerful. Because what happens, the bomb was right here and nothing happened. Because the high explosive worked, but the nuclear assembly did not work. Well, Salamos, which has never liked having Livermore in a game, sent them a telegram. Now that you're done, can we use your, your uh, test setup for our purposes? Uh, but just as important, and I think actually very important, you need expertise to tell you what's going on in the part of the world that is dangerous. So here's a picture of Kim Jong-un looking at what is supposedly a two-stage nuclear weapon. How do you know it's not a model? How do you know it's true? Because you're not there taking it apart. You have limited amount of uh, intelligence data. You can look at how much the ground shakes when a bomb goes off and other things. 
How do you know what it's like? You need experts to say what they're capable of. Could this be small enough to be placed on a missile? All the other things that go along. So stewardship is deterrence, but also making sure that you don't know what, you know what the world is doing. So you don't, play, you don't invade places like Iraq when you think they're doing nuclear weapons. So it's an important part of that. In Rochester, we play a big role in this. You know, we collect data, uh, all unclassified. We train students. This is uh, students that have been trained at Rochester going to the national laboratories. We develop uh, platforms for experiments, so you do a different type of experiment. We try it out because we can do thousands of experiments where the, the NIF and Z can do only 100. And we develop instrumentation to help us develop the platforms and to help us get the data. That's what we do. And this is actually a view graph from uh, Livermore and then NSA. Now, of course, it's not just big lasers. It's other facilities. And I had to show this since I knew it was coming here. And if I didn't, Yogi would be mad at me for years. Uh, so we built, uh, delivered the laser and target chamber for the laser shock facility at the dynamic compression sector at Argonne. It's a wonderful facility uh, doing wonderful science. And we were very happy to give one of the devices to create matter at more extreme conditions that Yogi and, his, and your students could, and, and the laboratories could use. There's a laser. This is a much more sophisticated laser than, uh, than the earlier lasers. It's much more compact. There's only 30 by 6 feet. It's a 100 joule UV laser. You'll see that's very important in, in later on. Uh, long, lots of flexibility in pulses, shots every 20 minutes. We could do this faster with more money, but it's Yogi's. You're happy with it, right, Yogi? All right. Um, better be. Uh, <laughs> Spend a lot of money, Mike. Yeah, not, we built a target chamber for this also. Uh, and it's a very sophisticated target chamber that translates, rotates to do all the different experiments that, you know, that you'd want to do there. We built a target assembly. This is, you know, little targets here, so you move it around so you don't have to open up the vacuum or do something crazy. You just rotate, shoot a target here, move over, shoot another target here. So you're able to, in one day, do 20, 24 experiments, I guess, whatever it is. Yes, yes. So, you know, fusion research, so this is a thing I give to take, take both a near and long-term look. So right now we're funded for this. That's how, that's how most of inertial fusion in this country is being funded. Uh, and what it's led to, uh, science, of course, not only fusion research, but also the science of other matter besides hydrogen to study the planets, to study uh, you know, the gaseous planets, the super Earths, to, make, to do research on that. And we have a very active program in that. Uh, Rip Collins, who runs that uh, for us, is uh, chairs, I think, is in your advisory committee. He'll be, he'd be here to give a very nice talk about all the work we're doing and compressing things other than hydrogen. Uh, we've also, uh, a lot of the science and technology that's come out of this program also has industrial applications. This is uh, how your future computer chip, your phone, I think, has about 2 billion transistors. In the future, we'll have seven or eight, and it'll be made with a machine called extreme ultraviolet lithography that came out of the laser fusion program. It makes 100 volt x-rays that are then imaged onto uh, uh, wafers uh, and made integrated circuits. That came out of the ICF program. It's now being uh, uh, propagated commercially in lots of different places. Uh, and uh, you'll be, you can thank fusion research for that. Because it pushes, you know, fusion research, especially here, pushes technology, lasers, diagnostics, optics, and materials. And of course, long term, energy. And the, you know, uh, one of the things the fusion program has done to its disservice is talk about how fusion is just 10 years away, 20 years away. And so one of the, art, one of the things that people say, it's a future energy source and always will be. Uh, I don't believe that, but it's, you know, probably none of us in this room will see commercial fusion power. I hope we do. I tell my son he'll either be 50 or 120, because biology will be the miracle of the 21st century. And hopefully a whole slice will turn on by a fusion power plant. But first, we have to make fusion work. And that's what I'll talk about next. All right, let me talk about now fusion. So inertial fusion, again, there's two ways to do fusion, as we talked about. One is using large magnetic fields. And uh, there's a big project in uh, Europe now called ITER, uh, which is uh, going to hopefully demonstrate uh, more fusion energy out than the energy to both make and heat the plasma and confine it. Uh, but inertial fusion uses matter's inertia to do the work. So what we do is we compress matter to very high densities. You always need, fusion always needs the high temperatures, but we have very high density. So the reaction rates are fast enough that the target burns up its fusion before it disassembles. And so, so it's, we're not being very clever. We call it inertial fusion. 
The nice thing about inertial fusion, there's lots of different ways of doing it. So this is what's done at uh, Livermore. Uh, this is the NIF. Uh, so here's laser beams coming in, 192 total. And inside, these laser beams irradiate a cavity, a whole room. You know, Max Planck won his Nobel Prize this, being in quantum mechanics. It's not a perfect whole room, but it's a hot whole room. So we, these lasers here will heat the whole room up to about 3 million degrees. Uh, at those temperatures, matter emits a lot of x-rays. Those x-rays will impact on the capsule and implode it. Uh, we do work with them uh, at the Omega, and we have scientists doing work with them at Livermore. Well, Salomon is also very much involved in that. Another approach uh, is what I'm going to talk on about is direct drive. So here the laser beam directly impinges on the capsule. Uh, and the advantage of that, of course, is that most of the energy of the laser here goes to heat up the whole room. Uh, but the good thing about it is you keep the laser beams away from the target, so any imperfection of laser beams are not seen by the target, or, or at least averaged out over the many laser beams. Here, all the laser beams hit the target. The advantage is it can couple five to ten times more energy into the fusion uh, device than this does, because the capsule is the fusion device. Uh, the disadvantage is that you have to really worry about how the light interacts with plasmas and the quality of the laser beams. So uh, Rochester is a lead lab in the entire world for this. This is uh, the uh, process that we use, and it is the lead laboratory in the entire world. So we do work in Naval Research Lab. We work with them. They come and use our facility. We, we use theirs a little bit. And we have Omega as the principal facility in the world for this. Uh, we also do work at NIF, and we do work at the Nike Laser at Naval Research Lab. Uh, another approach is using pulse power. Here what happens, laser beams, and laser or x-rays impinge on this. They heat the, I'll show you in a little bit later on, they heat the outer part of the target. You know, the thing, think of this as a spherical rocket. So the laser beams are the energized our rocket fuel. The DT is the payload, and we get this rocket moving in at high velocities, about a tenth of a percent of the speed of light. So when that converges, you know, when stagnates, that energy of kinetic energy is converted into internal energy pressure, and that's how fusion goes. So that's how we do it. So we have laser-driven or x-ray-driven ablation. In this, in this approach, uh, this is done with pulse power, we have a cylinder, not a sphere. Uh, and the cylinder, we dry, draw large currents along the cylinder, create its azimuthal magnetic field. And if you imagine, you think of it, the magnetic pressure implodes the target. So it's not ablation, it's magnetically driven. Uh, in this scheme, there are several different schemes, but in this scheme, we actually shoot a laser in there to heat up the DT a little bit. Because remember, a spherical convergence is better than a two-dimensional convergence. And so we want to heat it up and so we don't have to compress it as far. Uh, and we magnetize it so that once we heat it up, we don't lose the energy. It's, uh, the magnetic field insulates uh, the gas uh, from the cooler part of the target. This is a, Sandia's a lead laboratory here. We've done a lot of work. I'm going to show you a picture of this at uh, Rochester. Because we, we can actually use our laser to implode cylinders too. Uh, and it's done primarily at Z, but we do experiments in Megan. There'll be some experiments at NIF. So this is one of the advantages of inertial fusion. You have all these different ways of assembling matter at extreme conditions. So let me talk about, now I want to get into details about what we've been doing in direct drive. So here is a, here is a target. Now we, this is a pi diagram. So this is a sphere, but we just cut out a segment there so you can see what it is. So here is, here is our payload, this deuterium. So we, we cool this to 19 degrees. So it's, we want to get this high density. So start off with high density, right? You don't want to start off with low density. So let's start off with as high density we can get, you know, two tenths of a gram per cc. We want to get to hundreds of grams per cc, but we start off with two tenths. Uh, the rocket fuel is, uh, we call it a blader. It's, a, it's hydrocarbon, and it contains the DT. And so laser will come in, and we'll ablate this. This will heat up to kilovolt temperatures. It'll go rushing off here, and the reaction force implodes the capsule. Uh, and the laser is. This is a pulse history of this laser that's hitting the, 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 the ablator. And you see it's very, very complicated time history. Because what we want to do, and I'll explain a little bit later, when this target is assembled, it's, converged, it's composed of two components. It has a center region which is hot and not very dense. It's sort of like it's an ideal gas. And it's surrounded by most of the DT is degenerate hydrogen. So very, very high densities at low temperature, very little entropy generation. And the reason for that, it takes much more energy to heat something to 10 kilovolts than it does to compress something to 200 grams per cc. So we sort of divide the energy between uh, heating the center part and compressing the main part, the main fuel. And we do that by very, very carefully tailoring the laser in, in time. So this is a typical laser pulse. It's about two nanoseconds long. 
And what ha what, what's important in getting the experiments, what are the variables that we do? Well, we can change the dimensions of the target. We can change the thickness of this. We can change the thickness of that. We can change the composition. We can change its, its uh, size over some limited range. But here in the laser, we can change the laser beam. We can have this be bigger or smaller. We can move it earlier or later. We can change how fast this comes up because all of this determine the final fuel assembly. Uh, and you can see there's a lot, a lot of variables here uh, in doing this. What you like to have is predictive tools that can model, model all of these and tell you exactly what to do. Now the problem is if we did a million experiments a year, we'd be able to do this easily. But we do a thousand experiments a year, actually do a hundred of these implosions a year. So you want to have a predictive tool that really can tell you what to do. Uh, and unfortunately, that ain't the case. So here's, so, you know, we do a, a simulations with modern computers, one, two, and three dimensions. In one dimension, you can vary all of these things, of course, but it's only one dimension. But you, I can vary this laser pulse history, everything I want. I can vary the target uh, in any way I want. And that will give me a lot of, and I'll be able to use this, these codes basically to tell me to, what I should do with the laser and with the targets. And these codes are fast. We can run thousands of them in a relatively short amount of time. So it tells us what to do. You like, but unfortunately, the world is three dimensions. String, th string theory aside, we got three dimensions to work with. You know, these targets have stalks. They're mounted with stalks, as you saw in that earlier picture. That's a three-dimensional figure, figure on that. These things are classically hydrodynamically unstable. They're wonderful hydrodynamic experiments because you can imagine when the laser, when the target is imploding, we have a low-density gas pushing on a high-density material. Well, guess what? That's hydrodynamically unstable, right? Uh, as as uh, Taylor showed us, that the gravity and acceleration are the same thing in Raleigh-Taylor instability. And when it stagnates, we have a relatively low density gas stopping a high density gas. So we have two times where the thing is hydrodynamically unstable. So we want to turn our glass of water upside down and not have it fall out. It's a tough problem. So we do, but we have been developing you know, with high performance computing, two and 3D simulations, but they are slow and they don't allow all this parameter variation very quickly. So what we're doing now is actually mining the data from Omega to help us teach what, ha these, what these 1D codes tell us to do and to guide us what we have to do in 3D. So, so the two parameters that you worry about in inertial fusion, yield is obviously, that's how much fusion comes out. Rho R, this is the aerial density, the density radius product. That's our measure of confinement. All right, you imagine that, you know, the high Rho R's mean you have high fast burn up before it disassembles. So Rho R is a measure of confinement. Uh, and you can imagine, think about this, you're always talking about plasmas, NT, density times, right? Well, rho is density, and R gives you a size of how long the time is. The bigger R is, the longer it takes for it to disassemble. So these are confined, this is our n tau uh, in the typical uh, uh, ways in which people describe things. So we have a, we have a parameter, that didn't always translate here, called psi. So in fusion, you must have the temperatures, right? But then you have to have the pressure time product of a certain value no matter if you do magnetic fusion or inertial fusion. This p tau, that should be a tau there, and p tau ignition. p tau ignition is the generalized loss of number. It's the density, time, and temperature. And that, and that has to be 10 atmosphere seconds. So if I'm doing a tokamak, I, have a, you know, I get a density of around 10 to the 14, and I have a, it turns out it's about 10 atmosphere pressure. So I have to have the energy confinement for about a second, which is a long time in a plasma. In inertial fusion, my pressures are hundreds of gigabars, so my confinement time is just hundreds of picoseconds. And so what we're doing here is first you know, getting the yield up, and then once we get the yield up, we're going, to op op we're going to then fool around with this and this to try and get the confinement up. So first get it hot, then learn to confine it. And so what we've done is develop a modeling. It's, it's the beginning of machine learning in inertial fusion. It's the only way I can describe it. So we take all the data from, uh, you know, here's, uh, here's our 1D stuff. This is a Ricardo Betty. So I draw cartoons in one of my other hobbies. So you'll see cartoons spread around. So if you have any cartoon person you want me to draw, like Chris or Yogi, I'll be able to draw a cartoon of them. He is very good. So this is, this is Ricardo Betty, professor there. So what we do is so we run our 1D code, and it gives us yields. You know, the 1D code gives us all these observables, right? It gives us the yield. It gives us the velocity, the implosion. It gives us the, the rho r. It gives us ion temperature. Gives us the burn time. Gives us the confinement size. When we do experiments, uh, we measure all these things. And the question is: there a relationship between the experiments that we measure and the simulation models that tell us what to do? 
And here's, a, for example, you would imagine, here's an example, we're looking at the experimental yield, is can we find a functional relationship that relates these, these, these computated uh, values, or computed values, to tell us to predict our next experiment, to tell us how to move forward. And of course, this is, we're using a 1D code here, so that you, you would say, well, wait a minute, the world is 3D. How can you have a 1D code to give you as a guide for the future? Well, if the non-uniformities are systematic and reproducible, and that's why we spend so much time on Omega to make it a reproducible facility, so that we know where the targets are, we know what they're characterized, what they look like, how good the laser pulse is. We think that we have very, very good evidence, I'll show you that, that all our 3D effects are reproducible and systematic. So once we uh, find out exactly how the, the, the experimental yield will go with these things, we will find out what 3D effects make it a, make this function different from what it would be from a code. It's the beginning of machine learning. And here's an example of this. So here's, here's a yield, and you see all these, this is a, all the various things that we found, how it scales with the velocity of the implosion. This is a, this is a very simple number, don't worry about that, the row R, uh, and the size of the target. And what here is, what we've done, these are variations where we change the laser pulse or the target in a predictive way. And the predicted are the yellows, and the greens are the experiments. And we've been able to triple the fusion yield in one year. And it's a nature paper just came out about a month ago. First author is a graduate student. So we're beginning to use statistical machine learning to learn to predict the fusion stuff. Uh, and one of the things that we will find out, if you do a one-dimensional simulation, the yield should go for the rho r as the three halves power, a much stronger dependence on rho r. So we're finding out that the confinement time is not what we expect. So the confinement is not a one-dimensional idea of a confinement, it's much more complicated. So it shows us maybe the shell is broken up, it's very non-uniform, so this will teach us where the physics issues are that we have to look at in detail. But it allows us to advance the fusion performance. So here's an example of not, not just a yield, this is the confinement, the rho r, these are, these are all the data with our model. And uh, to show you how crazy it is, the, our computer model, our, our simulation model told us, remember I showed the laser pulse that goes up and sort of stays up? Well, the, the, our model said, go down, it looks better. And we did that and it worked, we got the best performance ever that we've ever seen in any of our target experiments. And we think what happens here is that this makes it a little bit more hydrodynamically stable. Now, of course, there are 3D effects. And so what do you, you know, how do you find 3D effects? So one of the, 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 one of the problems in inertial fusion, it, it comes from history from the nuclear weapons, you do an experiment and then you model that experiment. And you fool around with all the, the codes and such till you, get, you, ma you match the experimental observables. I, we feel very strongly, you don't learn from an experiment, you learn from trends in experiments. So you must do lots of experiments to figure out what's going on. And that's how you're gonna learn the physics. So that's what we're doing. So we're able to do five or so cryogenic experiments in a day. So we can do systematic variations. So one of the things we've done here, this is a laser pulse again you've seen, this is a target. So I, I won't go into a whole lot of detail here, but you know, these lasers are coherent. You know, lasers are coherent and we don't like coherence. We'd like to get the energy focus to a small spot in a, a short time with an incoherent light source. But these lasers, unfortunately, still have some coherence. I'm going to talk about that a little bit later, see how important that is. So a coherent laser, as everyone knows, has speckle. And that speckle is intensity modulations. And so the intensity modulations, when the laser is more intense, it burns off a little bit more, inten more material than when it's, not, you know, when it's not intense. So we have ablation. So we start off with a perfect sphere. The laser makes it a golf ball. Then we implode it. And that's turning my water upside down and falling out. So, we've, so what Rochester developed was a way of making these speckles a little bit better. So what we've done is we have speckles and we put modulation, temporal modulation on laser and it moves the speckles like this. So it's called SSD, smoothing by, spe smoothing by spectral dispersion. So what it does, it tries to get this imprint, which it's called, to be less. So how we, how we do that, we actually can change the bandwidth, how fast the speckles move. They can move like this, where you think it's not gonna have a big effect or else they can move like that and you think it'll be better. And so what we've done is looked at what happens uh, to the, the yield, or this is a row R, uh, as we make that imprint worse. Remember, so this is a, you know, we're doing these experiments all in the same day, and what we've done is we found that as we, as we smooth slower, guess what? Hydrodynamics gets worse, and so the confinement gets worse and worse. And so we're trying to, this will tell us what 3D effects are that we have to begin eventually to incorporate into our models and understanding. But it's how you see, this is not done by this experiment or that, it's looking at the whole trend. 
So one of the things that's important uh, for the, the, the national program is Omega is a 30 kilojoule laser, 30 terawatts, which is a, a big laser, but NIF is a 500 terawatt laser, uh, and we have 30 kilojoules typically. NIF has almost two megajoules, and actually have more than two megajoules. So what we want to do, we want to take our experiments and scale them to NIF. What happens if we did it not with a 30 kilojoules, but with a two megajoule laser? How would it work? Uh, and there's simple hydrodynamic scaling, which I'll show in a minute, but you can imagine mass scales with energy. And, and, and mass scales with essentially the cube of the target because we have the radius, obviously, and the thickness of the target is proportional to the radius. So it goes as basically R cubed. And so these targets, we have to do it by eventually the square root of the energy of NIF. So the targets are about four times the size, right? Because it's, again, mass and energy, and then and size goes as you know, basically R, R cubed, and so that's how we get the size. Does that make sense? That's how we do that. So what's hydrodynamic scaling? So what we do is we do the experiments on Omega, and we say we're going to do exactly the same experiment on NIF with the same parameters. So we're going to have the same speed. The adiabat is actually the amount of entropy generated produced in the fuel. So it's how the laser couples to the target. I'll talk about that in a minute. We say it's got the same pressure uh, that we have at, at Omega. Uh, the, the mass and volume scale with size, right? They get, they're going to go as a cube root of that. We, we assume that the same fraction of energy is absorbed. So when you shine a laser on a target, 100% of the energy is not absorbed. It'd be 50, 60%. So we assume that's the same. And then we assume all 3D effects just get four times bigger. And that's actually a conservative thing because the NIF targets, which are four times bigger than Omega, are better, are more uniform than the ones we shoot on the Omega. They're easier to fabricate at this size. So this is a very conservative assumption. What is not a conservative assumption and, and a, is a real problem in this field forever is how does the laser couple into the plasma? And that's a big dependence on scale size. Now, I will make this statement, hydro gets better. So imagine if I have a target that's a millimeter in size, and I have a stock that's 20 microns in size. Now I go to NIF, and I have a four millimeter target, and still a 20 micron stock. It will have much bigger effect at one millimeter than it does at four. But laser plasma interaction physics, and this has been, I'm going to talk about that in the last part of the talk, has been a problem in this field since its inception. Lasers don't like to interact with plasmas in a good way. So we've had to go through a lot of history to make lasers better, uh, and I'll talk about that in, in a minute. But so this is something we have an active program on NIF. The way to think about this, think of a plasma as, a, as an amplifier. The laser will establish some instabilities in this amplifier. The bigger the amplifier is, the more gain there is to the system. And these targets are four times as big, so the plasmas are four times the size. So the amplifier is four times bigger. So we have to worry about that. And the nice thing we have right now, we have NIF to look at that. When Chris said I was very much involved in when getting NIF, we had a 30 kilojoule laser called Nova. We tried to figure out what would the plasma physics be at two megajoules. And we made, we did our best research, and we were far too optimistic. It's much more difficult at the four megajoules, at the megajoules than we thought it was based on our experiments. Here we have a facility at the right scale. So, so how do you do hydroscaling? Pretty simple. Here's the yield. The yield goes as, you know, n, you know, n, it's a simple equation, n squared. So pressure, pressure squared. The react, this is, you know, this is a, a thing we measure on omega. And we, and we need pressures of about 100 uh, gigabars. Uh, this is just temperature dependent on the reaction rate, sigma v bar over the temperature. Volume will get bigger, right? Bigger tar, bigger mass, bigger energy, and so will the confinement time. And they will scale, as I said, about the cube root of energy. Uh, and then one of the things that also is important for inertial fusion, or all fusion, when we use deuterium and tritium, and so the reaction products of that are a neutron, 14 MeV, and a 3.5 MeV alpha particle. Well, the neutron escapes the plasma. It's uncharged. It goes out. The alpha particle, is, with the plasma big enough, stays within the plasma and self-heats. That's called ignition. So you have a thermal runaway when the energy of the fusion contributes to the plasma energy and runaway is fusion, so fusion takes off. So that's a major, major goal of all fusion events is to demonstrate this thing called ignition. Omega is far too small to get ignition. We don't have enough rho r. And so what we do is we figure out what the yield is on omega, on NIF, based on the results in omega, assuming there's no alpha deposition. And, that, and so if we did that at 1.9 megajoules, taking the same experiments I showed you, uh, we would get somewhere around 150, 200 kilojoules of fusion, about three or four times what NIF has done uh, so far. At 2.5 megajoules, which Livermore is looking to make NIF this big, 
uh, we get something which is, you know, hundreds of kilojoules, a few hundred more kilojoules. And this is without alpha particles. So this just means you're getting the fusion from the implosion system. So what we have, without going into all the details, we've done a lot of work. What happens with alpha deposition? If you start having alpha deposition, this is what happens. This is the yield if you, with alphas. And this is the yield assuming alphas were neutrinos. They just went right through. So you see what happens when you get this uh, psi. This is this pressure time over the ignition time, the Lawson criteria. When this is you know, one, you begin, you begin to see a lot of self-heating from the alpha particles. So NIF right now, to give you a sense, omega and NIF are around 0.7. If, I mean, if we scaled omega to NIF, it'd be about 0.7. NIF is NIF, so they don't have to scale. So they've actually had neutron yields, which are about three times higher because the alphas are depositing their energy in the fuel. So if you just, if you just took the uh, alphas away, you would get a certain, you would get a certain amount, you would get about 15 or so kilojoules of fusion. When you put the alphas in there, they heat the plasma up, and of course, you get more fusion. So where NIF is about here right now, and if you took direct drive, it would be about here now, but with five times the mass. So this is what happens. This actually, this is an omega experiment. This is, this is a now multi-dimensional calculation, and you can see our water is trying to fall out of the glass. This is a dense fuel, and this is the hot fuel right here. Uh, this is what happens when you put it on, uh, on NIF. You see the scale size from 40, it's about a factor of three or four bigger. Uh, and this was, not, this was supposed to be a different figure. This is what happens when you put alphas in here. You begin to see these spikes be burned away because the alphas burn them away. But the bottom line is, if you did this right now with NIF, uh, we would get about 500 kilojoules of fusion at NIF and about a megajoule, two and a half megajoules. So we're getting close to gains of about a half, a quarter to a half. To give you a sense, uh, the direct drive program, indirect drive program, the maximum fusion yields are about uh, 50 kilojoules. So direct, it shows the advantage of coupling more energy to the target. Now we're trying to show that works, you know, that we're going to take Omega experiments and do them on NIF. So here's an experiment we've done on Omega uh, with about a 1,200, about a little over a millimeter target. Here's one with four millimeters. Remember I told you about three or four times the size. Uh, these are done, uh, done experiments or targets made at General Atomics. Here's a laser pulse, and you see the longer laser pulse with the bigger target, right? Scale, size, and time. And here we did experiments, got about 1.4, 10 to the 14th DT. We took all our physics knowledge, scaled it, and we predicted a yield of 1.3 times 10 to the 16 yields. So we're very close in showing the hydro scale. And these are simple targets, but it's the beginning of what we're doing now to show the, how that you can scale from the, the wind tunnel works. Think of Omega as a wind tunnel and NIF as the airplane. Now, one of the things I want to end on uh, talking about fusion, I'm going to talk about plasma physics next, is that we need to be innovative in ICF research. This is one of the nice things about inertial fusion. You have all these different ways of making matter at extreme conditions. So you can actually have laser pulses that look like this, that look small, and they go boom. What you would do here, and Yogi would like this, you first compress the target slowly. You don't try and heat up the center. And then you launch a giant shock at the end and hope that shock converges and heats up the center and lights it off. It's called shock ignition. You can do that with lasers. Pulse power can't do that. Indirect drive can't do that. We can do targets with multiple shells. We don't have to have one shell. We can have a rocket. That's, we can have a multi-stage rocket. And we can do it the same way. We, you know, just as a multi-stage rocket, we can, use each, the, you know, we can use each stage actually to get our, increase our implosion velocity and get us fusion. We're doing work with this right now with multi-shell targets. We can do magnetic fields. Remember, these plasmas are uh, plasmas, and so the magnetic field, if we put a magnetic field in the beginning, the, the plasmas are, are such that the mag, what's called the magnetic Reynolds number keep, freezes the field in with the plasma. And so as a plasma is imploded, the B field's imploded. As flux is concerned, so we can take an initial field of a few Tesla and get 100 megagauss fields in the end. At those fields, not only the electrons stopped, but so are the alphas. So uh, we're, you know, this is an example of that. This is, a NIF. This is NIF right now, uh, right down here. This is a model that if I put different magnetic fields, I can get not fractions of yield. These are 10 megajoule yields. So we're encouraging Livermore to put magnetic fields on their targets. This is a, remember I told you this, uh, this process that Sandia is doing when they implode with a, beef, with a uh, high, high current? Well, we can implode with lasers. I'm going to show you this in a minute, some real data. And we've actually been able to do the experiments at, at Z on Omega. So Omega is about, uh, we have about a thousand times less energy on Omega than Z does with target. And so we're able to do scaling over a factor of uh, a thousand in energy, a factor of 10 in size. So here's an example of an experiment. 
So here's a, this is a cylinder. You see where the outer part is out here. Laser's on, so the cylinder is imploding. You see the gas stagnating, get hot on axis. And before it gets here, we shine a laser beam here so it heats up the gas. And so when it finally stagnates, we have uh, you know, not only the energy of compression, we have the energy of preheat. So this is something, this, this whole experiment lasts a nanosecond. So you see that the ability to do this. And uh, we've had very, very nice results on this funded by RPE. All right, laser plasma interaction physics. That's hydrodynamics. Now I'm going to talk about light interaction with plasmas. So here's a little elementary thing. How, does, how do we generate plasma instabilities with a laser? Well, here comes, this is, uh, here's our laser beam coming in. And here's our plasma. Electrons are very mobile. So they start oscillating in the field. The ions being less mobile, they're not moving so fast. So the electrons start oscillating and they radiate, right? An oscillating charge radiates. So it makes another uh, electromagnetic field that beats together with the incoming field and it pushes the particles in, in troughs of the wave. Basically, the ponderosa force does that. If, that. if that wavelength is a plasma resonance, you have an instability that grows exponentially. And uh, what that does, it scatters the light energy. I'm going to show you examples of that. Uh, it reduces the absorption. It, in, it reduces the pressure that implodes it. It makes energetic particles that add entropy to the fuel. It does everything you don't want it to do. Now, that's uh, how people have looked at this. What's in real life, we don't have one laser beam interact with the plasma. We have lots of laser beams interacting with the plasma. So the light that it doesn't have to grow from noise, we already have a laser beam that's high amplitude. So these two laser beams will now interact, do the same thing, but it doesn't have to grow from noise. It can grow from the other beam. Uh, and this has a, been a big problem that has become well aware only in the past decade. Uh, this is an example of this. This is the, the, K, the momentum of the laser, another momentum of another laser. This is an ion acoustic wave. And that ion acoustic wave will actually make a grating and scatter the light around. So, and this is another cartoon of Marshall Rosenbluth. If anyone knows Marshall, Marshall was the Pope of plasma physics, a wonderful man, wonderful friend. And he's the one who started a lot of this research back in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Let me show you an example. So here's a target, right? Here's, remember, this target is imploding. And the, you know, the, the plasma is formed. Remember, when a plasma reaches its critical density, when the electron plasma frequency equals the light frequency, the light can no longer penetrate. That's why we used to have blackouts when we'd have re enter the, when the shuttles and such would re enter the atmosphere. You could no longer communicate to them because the plasma blocked it out. So, but, uh, so here, this is a surface uh, of, uh, uh, that blows out. Here comes a laser beam in here. Remember, laser beams have wings, They're, they have fall off at the edges like anything does. Well, this laser beam will refract, this part of the laser beam will refract around. It doesn't have much energy, but what will happen, it will interact with this incoming laser beam, and this will now tell this laser beam, give me all the energy, and it takes it away. So this laser beam, instead of coming here with full energy, is robbed. It's called cross-beam energy transport, something that uh, uh, we're not very clever about naming things. So here's a simulation of this. Here's a laser beam, and this is, a, this is a code that's an electromagnetic code, so the light is treated as an electromagnetic wave. You see the speckle in here that I told you about? So here's the target here. Here comes two beams coming in. Uh, and then we're going to grow up this interaction region. Uh, and over here, you see the plasma basically forming a grating. And so the light, this beam will come out and scatter up there. So this is a big problem in uh, direct drive and actually an indirect drive. All right, next view graph. Why is this important? Well, first of all, the absorption is reduced. Remember, we want to get hundreds of, we want to get 100 gigabars or so more in the, in the uh, final pressure of the target. And that goes directly as how much energy is absorbed. So when the energy goes down, obviously the pressure is going to go down for the same amount of mass. We're not going to get it as hot. This ablation pressure, this pressure which implodes the target, also goes, you know, goes down because the absorption goes down. And if I want to get the hot spot pressure, I have to what's called increase the IFAR. What this IFAR is, it's the thickness of the shell. It's a measure of hydrodynamic stability. You would like the thickness of the shell to be one. That doesn't work. It has to be somewhere of order 20. To get, able to get the hot spot pressures with the ablation pressure reduced, we have to increase the IFAR so the things becomes even more unstable. Uh, the other, and also what we do is increase the adiabat. We add entropy to the fuel. So all, this, all these laser plasma interactions, here again, the hot spot pressure, Alpha is a ratio of the fuel, the pressure in the main fuel to the, uh, uh, the Fermi degenerate pressure. You want it to be as close to one as you can. We, we try to do it about two. Uh, plasma physics can raise us to five or 10, so it kills you. So it means you need either more ablation velocity, pressure, more implosion velocity, more absorbed energy. 
So all of these things make the laser more difficult. And it impacts everything. This is uh, the thing I told you about where we preheat a cylinder. Well, you want, you want this laser beam just to heat the gas. You don't want it to be backscattered out. You don't want it to be steered into the wall and make material that, that now mixes with the fuel. Here in NIF, you imagine this is a complicated plasma, and this light interacts in lots of different ways. And the NIC campaign, if any of you followed the original ignition campaign at, at, uh, uh, on NIF, every photon was, was, had a plasma instability. Every photon, either Raman or Brillon, scattered. So it was impossible to get the results because plasma physics prevented it. And direct drive, it does all the things I just talked about. So we have a major program now of understanding laser matter interaction in a fundamental way. Uh, this is just an example of what we're doing on NIF. Here's a target again that I explained. Here's our target here. And what we do is we, you know, it's not only how many energetic particles you make out here, how many get to the fuel. And we can do this at the scale of NIF, which is a scale of ignition. And we find out we're just about at the limit we can take. So the entropy generation that we would get on a, on a NIF target is close to about what's tolerable for, uh, for fusion. So we're motivated to solve this. So how, what have we done? So here's the omega chamber, which I mentioned to you before. And here's this other laser. What we have done is to take this laser beam and make it broadband. So here's the, here's the, the spectrum uh, as a function of wavelength for the one micron light, because we frequency upconvert these things. You see it's very narrow band. And all the beams on omega are this narrow band. What we've done now is we've taken this uh, laser beam, and we can tune it over a broad wavelength. Why is that? Because the plasma, these instabilities I told you about, depend on the plasma conditions. And if I can make the laser incoherent, it doesn't drive these things. And so what we've done is actually use this laser to interact with plasmas here. I'm going to show it in a minute. And this is, again, an example of the plasma physics. Here's the seed laser. This is a, this broadband laser. This blue laser is this narrow frequency here. We can have this laser interact with one beam. There's an ion acoustic wave here. We can interact it with six beams. You see all the different ion acoustic waves, so it's much more complicated. Uh, and actually, we can do it we have the beams interacting, not coming at it. This is a backscatter geometry. We can do it in a forward scatter geometry. So all the different geometries to do fundamental plasma physics. And what, first, you need to make a plasma. So what we have done, we've made plasmas independently of the other beams. So we used a uh, number of beams of omega to make a gas jet plasma at very high temperature and density. So we make plasmas near a kilovolt and densities of uh, this range over a millimeter in size. So this is a big target now. So now this plasma is made independently of the laser beams interact with. So we now have a platform. Plasmas are done independent, and now we can see what happens when we have light interacting with them. So what we also have done is, you know, one of the assumptions that people always make is the electrons are Maxwellian. You know, you have, you have, you have, you have a Maxwellian equilibrium distribution. Well, it turns out that's not the case. And why is that not the case? I'll tell you in a minute. But first, you have to measure it. So what we have done, we measure everything with Thompson scattering, as I showed in the last view graph. And we have made a very elaborate optical system that allows us to take Thompson scattering from 120 different directions in the same shot. So we can measure the distribution function by looking at the scattering from all these different angles and sample different parts of the distribution function, you know, the phase velocity where we make the measurements. So we can actually now measure distribution functions in plasmas. Now what happens with the laser, so here's an example of a scattered spectrum we would have at two extreme distribution functions. One is a Maxwellian, and one is a, a super, what's called a Langdon distribution. I'll explain that in a minute. So we're, now we're measuring the electron distribution functions. And here's an example of how important that is. Heat flux. Remember, we have to absorb, and we have to understand how the energy flows in the plasma. And here is basically a comparison of uh, data with a model. So this red stuff here is uh, basically uh, our data. Taken, we measure the distribution functions and take its moments to get the heat flux. And here is uh, what you'd get if you calculated by classical plasma physics, Spitzer theory. And you can see that when the mean free paths are small compared to the gradients, not surprise, the fusion works. When the mean free paths are large compared to the gradients, you see much, the heat flux is much reduced. So this is a very, very important part to understand uh, the physics. And it's, this is going to be, if you go to, it's on physics of plasma, it's on the cover. And it's actually going to be in the halls of DOE because they like it so much. The other thing is, what about distribution functions in general? So here's a, the Gaussian order. You know, Maxwell is n equals 2. What happens is you make the laser intensity go up. The laser heats the particles uh, by inverse Bremsch along to start with. And that goes basically the heating rate is one of the velocity cubed. And so we're heating cold electrons. 
there's not enough time for them to redistribute and fill out the tail. So that we have, so the electrons, there's many fewer electrons at the tail of the distribution than you would think. Remember, when you're doing plasma physics, you always assume the distribution is Maxwellian, and you can actually figure out how many electrons are at the tail for things like Landau damping, not the case. So here's an example of uh, data. This is a model called the Bruce Langdon model, which was built around that, and you can see as the laser becomes more intense, the order of the, of the distribution function is increasing. So that's a major thing that explains a lot of the plasma physics that we have not understood for 40 years. So what we're doing now is uh, using this platform to study plasma physics. So here's, again, simple thing. Here's a laser beam coming in. Another laser beam interacts with. This is the ion acoustic wave. And what we can do is look at, as we shift the laser beam frequency, what you imagine, you're looking at different regions of the plasma because they have to momentum and energy match. Uh, and that depends on the local plasma condition. So when you make the laser beams at different frequencies, this matching conditions happen someplace else. And this, what it does, it, it changes the gain of these instabilities. The other thing that we can do, we can run the laser beam so that the, uh, the instabilities, the, the, basically the amplitude of the plasma waves become extremely nonlinear. So a lot of people do linear plasma theory, these instabilities. We can run this up to almost uh, delta n equals n over 1 if we uh, really want to do, but like 10% is something we're going to do soon. So here's an example of an experiment. I'm an experimentalist. I like experiments. Here's the beam that comes in. Remember, here's our plasma. We've already formed it. And what we do is we measure the light that's transmitted through here. So here's this laser beam coming in. If nothing happened, you'd get exactly what went in is what went out. Here's the other laser beam coming in here. So these laser beams are now interacting with the plasma. So here's the experiment here. What we do is we run this laser beam for a nanosecond, like that. We run this laser beam for half a nanosecond. So we can see what happens when this turns off. And so here's, here's the data. This is what goes in. And when we make the laser beam, this beam, a little blue shifted, it now decays into this beam and an ion acoustic wave. And so what happens is this energy is, this, ener this beam is robbed of energy and it goes into this beam. So you see how it goes down. And when, the, when this beam turns off, it comes back to normal. Now what happens if we redshift it? The other thing happens. Now this beam decays and gets energy to this beam. So you're actually seeing energy transfer going back and forth between the beams mediated by this ion acoustic instability. And again, you know, and so, and from this amplitude growth, we can calculate the gain. How much gain did we see and everything else. So we can compare it to all our linear and nonlinear theories. It's a wonderful experiment, uh, and we just begun to mine this. And to show you how important it is, this understanding distribution functions, we can't get the data unless we have a non-Maxwellian. Now we have not only the plasma background, we have the electron distribution function, which impacts these things. So uh, this is, a, I think, a, this will be a, I will say it, a whole new revolutionary way of doing laser plasma interaction physics. We have the tools to do it. So now, why, let me get a little bit of history here, change the subject, but you'll see it's motivated by plasma physics. So a long time ago, many years ago, when ICF first started, uh, there were two lasers that were chosen to do research. One was uh, the Shiva laser. It was neodymium glass operating at one micron. The other one was CO2 at Los Alamos running at 10 microns. They both had lousy beams, I'll explain in a minute. These were the first lasers, and guess what? They didn't work. This went away. If you look, this is a CO2 amplifier. It's at Los Alamos. So this is me standing next to it. I always ask people, is this, a, a, is this a, an apartment for visiting scientists or a CO2 amplifier? It's a CO2 amplifier. This laser uh, was at uh, Livermore. It's long gone. But this was the first generation. So these lasers essentially killed the program. Luckily, uh, people uh, were able to uh, find laser materials, nonlinear optics, which increased, will allow us to do frequency up conversion. So what we can do, I won't go into all this in any detail, but if you use, any of you use lasers, you know, nonlinear optics, KDP and the like, you can, up, you can, they're frequency up converters. So luckily, people grew crystals big enough that you could take lasers like the next generation laser, Nova, and make it a third micron. And uh, in plasma physics, the ratio of intensity times wavelength squared divided by temperature is a parameter talking about instability. You want that thing to be small. And so, of course, one way to make it small, make the laser wavelength shorter. So that's what's done. That happened at NOVA. It's now Omega was this, and this a Nike laser at uh, NRL. So this is a second and third, and now that's a second generation laser. What's the third generation laser? The la these laser beams are far too coherent, and both spatially and temporally. Our targets are a millimeter or bigger. And remember, if you have a third micron beam, it can be focused to a, a few microns. 
you want to destroy the spatial coherence and make them consistent with the target. So that's what, we, that's what was done. And then on top of that, remember, we smooth them around like this. So that's second generation, third generation laser. So every laser in the world operates this way now uh, in ICF. SSD was invented at Rochester. So a NIF, you know, NIF actually is a wonderful laser, but it, it's a laser of the late 20th century. So it is not a fourth gener a third, it is a, a third generation laser. So it's time to invent. We need a better laser. So this is a picture of uh, Albert Einstein. I remember, I have to show you cartoons. That's one of my cartoons. Evan is my grandson. So what we have found out, if we destroy the temporal coherence, bandwidth, we can make the instabilities go away. Because these are resonant processes. We can essentially spread out that resonance over a bigger plasma. It doesn't work. So here's an example of absorption. Remember I told you this cross beam energy transfer? So we're down now, because of it, at about 55% absorption. If we make the laser have bandwidth of less than a percent, we get up to almost 90%. So that's like doubling your laser for no cost, if you do that. Same thing here, this is uh, making electrons which are hot, don't pay much attention to that, but we can do the same thing. We can make the instabilities that make hot electrons also go away if we have bandwidth, and we can make it smoother because the speckles go away when you have this incoherent source. So what we're doing now is uh, developing lasers which have greater than 1% bandwidth in the ultraviolet. So it has something between 10 and 20 terahertz bandwidth. And we're, just like we did this with this other laser beam, this is, a angstrom, this is tunable over about 30 angstroms. This laser will be tunable over about 300 to 500 angstroms. So we're gonna make, a, we're gonna make an incoherent source and then we're gonna find the plasma physics with this. This will hopefully would be the next generation lasers that will make ICF more practical and work better. And I bring this up, the last thing I wanna show is that you know, when you do new laser stuff, you, you win new things. So this is a Nobel Prize, it was done this last year by uh, people at the University of Rochester who invented a thing called chirp amplification. That's me in a monkey suit. That's uh, Donna Strickland, who was uh, one of the winners. She won the Nobel Prize for her thesis work. So all of you graduate students, you can think about that. There's a chance out there to win a Nobel Prize. Uh, and uh, she's done, she's wonderful. What we did, we took their idea, and we did this at the Nobel laser, and we made a laser that was a petawatt. So we increased, uh, they, they, this laser they made was about a terawatt, 10 to the 12th watts. We took one beam of the Nova laser and made it a trillion, basically a, ten, a thousand times bigger. This is uh, Mike Perry, who was a, basically my student who did this. And this person sitting next to is Charlie Towns, who invented the laser. So this was a big thing for Charlie that you know, within, a, within his lifetime, he saw these lasers, these little things, and all of a sudden he had something that had a thousand terawatts in the laboratory. It was uh, quite remarkable for him to see. So what we're doing now, this is now a little bit out, outside of ICF, we're taking that idea and we're gonna use our, our laser EP to actually make 230 petawatt lasers to do relativistic plasma physics and crazy things that I can only begin to imagine. So we put a proposal into the National Science Foundation to, to not only increase the capability of a mega, but to actually make a laser that is many times more powerful than any laser in the world, but not one of them, but two of them. So you can imagine these two lasers can be used together, they can, can co-propagate, or else they can uh, anti-propagate, and one can make high energy electrons, and you can make a Compton source, a laser accelerator, and probe it, and all these crazy things. So uh, this would be unique, and it just shows that Rochester's continue to invest and make lasers uh, better and better, and more interesting science tools. One more view graph. So, uh, fusion is wonderful, I've, I've spent my whole career on it, I still like it. I'm not tired of it. It's hard. You know, science is about doing hard things. This is John Sethian. Uh, John was a researcher at the Naval Research Lab. He also was uh, working here. Uh, and so, yeah, so when he retired, I drew a cartoon of him. Uh, and uh, he's holding uh, fusion targets here. This is uh, Steve Dean of Fusion Power Associates saying, Where's, how come I don't have fusion? Where's Mr. Fusion? Uh, I called him the field marshal because he was so effective in running programs that he did it with an iron hand. But John is a great guy, and you're lucky to have him involved in your program. And I think that's it. So thank you very much. I hope this was enjoyable. <laughs> Any questions? I'll ask questions. Come on, someone's going to ask me a question. Come on. Yes? I still worry about it, <laughs> uh, but it's been probably 
there was a lot of effort in the early 2000s to get more reproducible fabrication. So that's when it got better. So it's probably, it's probably been about 10 years. It still needs to be better than it is because you know, we're asking targets to be, give you, I like to say an ICF target is a three-dimensional mesos, mesoscale structure with nanofabrication tolerances made out of exotic materials. So and that's what it is. So you know, we, we shoot targets. The roughness that we have on the ice layer that I talked about the submicron, we'd like it to be half a third of that size. But it's much better, and you see the experiments are extremely reproducible in Omega, which is a sign that the targets, if the targets weren't reproducible, then neither would the experiments be. Mike, one thing you didn't comment on, since SBI is a killer, how much does that, does that depend on the blade of the material? How does it depend on the material? How much does that depend on the blade of the material? That's a good, uh, very much so. Uh, so what is the idea of the blade of the material? So from a hydrodynamic standpoint, mm -hmm. the ideal blader material is hydrogen. The zero ray is the best, and so that's, that's the best one. But uh, unfortunately, that, you know, the, the scale lengths, things, the scale lengths are more general there, which makes the LPI worse. So you want to have something which is, uh, the ideal situation would be something that's very high Z, because the collisionality would be overwhelming, but that, that's you know, very bad bladers for that. So we think the best ablator is probably carbon. It's diamond for direct drive. It's actually it turned out to be the best ablator for uh, indirect drive because of ablation characteristics and, and, and density and such. So probably something like carbon. And so we've been doing mostly polymers right now. There are years to do, but we'll be doing uh, 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 carbon in the future. Yes? I mean, all your lasers run at 350 nanometers. That's so immutable of your... Uh, yeah, it's a third harmonic, yes. But what would be a better wavelength that you could pick for? Short as possible. But it's, a, but it's a trade off. I mean, you know, you know, the one micron is very damage resistant. I mean, you know, as you get these photons to be multiple volts, the uh, damage threshold of optics goes way down. So, one of the problems of going to shorter and shorter wavelengths is optical, is basically optical damage. To give you a sense, uh, one micron at a nanosecond type pulse is the damage threshold is 40, 40 joules per square centimeter. Uh, at a third of mega, it's probably five to eight. And so what that does, why apertures are this big is because of that. You'd like them to be this big because of the cost of that. So that was, that's one of the reasons why it took so long to get you know, these high power three mega lasers to get the optics, not only to grow the crystals to be large enough to do the conversion, but to have the optics to be able to survive three mega. It's one of the reasons why the Exmer lasers, which are better, I mean, they're, they're krypton fluoride and argon fluoride are 2,500 and 1,900 angstroms, but the problem is the optics and, uh, and their e-beam pump too, which makes it more difficult. But, that's, but it's a trade-off. You have to look at the system, right? You have to look at the whole system. Any other questions? Who thinks fusion is going to work? Well, anyone, do you think you'll see it in your lifetime? I'll ask you a question. Who thinks so? Do you think fusion power will be on the grid in your lifetime? Raise your hand. In my lifetime, no. For the next one, yeah. All right, you, you're an optimist. Good, I believe in optimism. No, it's good to be an optimist. I think optimism is good.